it's gone seven thirty. Um, so I think it's uh, now time for us to start this evening's meeting. Uh, please can I ask anyone who's not talking uh, to put themselves on mute and then just unmute yourself if you're asking any questions um, later on. OK, so thank you and welcome to the meeting. Um, first uh, item tonight is apologies for absence. Nick? Yes, I have a few apologies from Judy Davis, from Nick and Roseanne Holmes and also from Alan Cook. OK. Um, well, um, first of all, um, I'd like to introduce you to tonight's speaker, Ian Ogden, who I think most people know. Uh, Ian is a, a local Raz Radar resident. Um, I think this, this shows how, how, how well and what sort of people we have in Radar, that over the last sort of uh, year and a half, two years, we've had uh, Vicky Burrow speaking, Raymond Rivnon, Chris Dell, Simon Smell, Ron Eccles, James Grundy, and now Ian Ogden, and all these people are, are local people. So um, I think we have a lot of talent locally, and I think it's nice to be able to get people who, who, who uh, live locally to speak to us. Um, Ian is, in fact, going to explain himself why he is somebody who is so competent to talk on this subject. So without further ado, I shall pass you over to Ian. Uh, good evening, everybody. Can, uh, can I just ask if, if Ian Thomas or... Um, uh, yourself David is there I've just got a slight problem in that uh, the mini screens are on the left hand side of my screen and I can't maximize the uh, the slide unfortunately if you go to slideshow you might be able to do it from the top right, hang on. yeah hang on like that Right, that's better. Yeah. Okay, thanks, David. Right. Yes, good evening, uh, everybody. A um, couple of things before I actually start the presentation um, proper. Uh, first of all, to thank the Association Committee for uh, inviting me to uh, come and do this presentation on a particular subject, which is perhaps not the usual sort of thing that um, you uh, come to, to see or listen to. Uh, but something that I think is really extremely important. Um, secondly, just to give you a few points of detail in relation to uh, slotting myself into the, the subject area, if you like, in relation to what I've done previously. Um, serious interest in African wildlife for most of my adult years. And uh, I used to be a member of the North of England Zoological Society, uh, and, uh, which is based in Chester. And I used to do uh, two or three years work as a volunteer in the education division at Chester Zoo there, uh, related to the society. And in fact, organized a safari tour, two week safari tour to Northern Tanzania for society members in, uh, in 1997. Uh, particularly in relation to that, and two years later, I actually found myself back in that area because I volunteered to go and do a month's work in a place called Tarangiri National Park in North Tanzania on a lion research and conservation project. So I spent a month doing that and several years later went and did a similar sort of thing in southern Botswana, but this time in relation to, uh, to elephants. To start off the, uh, the presentation proper, I think it's useful to have a look at the connection between ourselves and lions over the ages. Lions have become quite a, an important symbol uh, in our culture over a period of many years. If you look at the, uh, the top left hand illustration or image on the slide there, you will see an example of um, hominid cave drawings uh, going back a number of several thousand years uh, which can be found in France, depicting lions. There are various other ways in which lions have been, uh, shall I say, inserted as, as worthy images into our society. Um, prominent symbol in early civilizations in the Middle Ages in relation to chivalry, tribal and national flags and totems. Right in the center, you've got the national flag of Sri Lanka, for example, with the uh, 
the standing line with a sword in its hand. And then, of course, we come right up to the modern age, the musical Lion King down in the bottom center. Uh, and uh, commercial symbols, of course, like the, uh, the Peugeot symbol over on the, the left hand side. The reason I wanted to, to give this presentation tonight uh, in conjunction with Lion Aid, who are a, a newly established charity to uh, try and assist with the, the crisis which confronts Africa's lions at the moment um, is this. And you can see some of the information on the, uh, the next slide there. Based on reliable information from not too many years ago, there are fewer now than, uh, than 10,000 lions in Africa. Africa is a huge continent. 10,000 lions there is really very, very little. There are only 14 countries over the whole continent where there are actually any kind of lion population. There are only three of those in which the allied scientists consider that those populations are sustainable. The population across the continent has unfortunately crashed in the last 20 years by something like 60%. Um, um, there are statements from one or two people that I've, I've come across lately, uh, a couple of well-known wildlife filmmakers and photographers, a uh, couple by the name of Joubert, who reckon that in 2013, there were only 20,000 lions then. That, of course, is now uh, eight years ago. A key thing um, we need to uh, consider, and I've just gone a bit too far there, I'm afraid. Need a previous slide. Can I get back to the previous one, uh, Nick? Uh, the left arrow key should take you back one, Ian. Right. Sorry about that, thank you. Yeah, that's as you can see there is a, a map of Africa and Southeastern Asia. The red area is what used to be the, uh, the naturally, the area in which lions naturally occurred many, many years ago, thousands of years ago, really. Um, the blue areas, much, much smaller, obviously, and quite separated are the areas in which lions are said to exist now. That is today's reality. That's a reality of uh, 21st century Africa. Just to give you a little bit of fundamental information on the, on the species, the main species we're talking about here is the what people tend to refer to as the African lion, Panthera leo. And it mentions there 9,000 question mark. They are almost exclusively in Eastern and Southern Africa. Just to go back to the previous slide again, you might perhaps have noticed that there are two gray areas in the continent, which is where lions have never really existed uh, and which are not really natural lion habitats. One is the core of the Sahara Desert in Northern Africa, and one of the tropical forests in Central Africa, the Congo Basin. Tropical forests had never really been natural habitat for lions. So most of the lions, as they have existed for some time, in recent, more recent times, and now, uh, as you can see on that slide, are situated, ma situated mainly in Eastern and Southern Africa, Kenya, Tanzania, South Africa, Botswana, those sort of areas. So the, the main sort of subspecies of Panthera leo. Then you have Panthera leo senegalensis, a Western African lion. It's uncertain as to how many of these still exist. As you can see there, 350 question mark. Uh, but again, if you perhaps remember from the previous map, 
um, probably really quite small populations in separated areas. The, the one which you hopefully will be able to see on the uh, right hand side is the uh, Asiatic lion, Pandora leo persica. And there is only one population, as far as we're aware, of those, has been for many years. They are in India, northern India, in the state of Gujarat, uh, in the Gir forest, uh, where there is a population, we think, of approximately 500 now. The problem with that, apart from any of the other uh, areas, um, where lions are, is that there is little, if any, in anything in the way of options for expansion of that population. If we look at other species, other endangered species, and you quite possibly heard about a number of these, uh, most typically, of course, perhaps the African elephant and the way its populations have been decimated in recent decades, largely as a result of poach poaching. Uh, but there are other issues which we'll touch on a little bit later, uh, particularly in relation to lions. But also it mentions their lowland gorillas, who are quite possibly uh, familiar, more and more familiar with the upland gorilla, uh, who Diane Fossey, a naturalist, was involved with some years ago before she was killed. Um, but lowland gorillas are in low numbers too. Orangutans in Southeast Asia. Chimpanzees, strangely enough, yes, in Africa, down to a relatively small population. Polar bears, of course, you may well be aware of, and it may be a logical train of thought, if you like, in relation to global warming, the shrinking of the ice caps. Um, and top left in an image there, uh, it mentions white rhinoceros. The two rhino species in Africa, uh, it's a little unfortunate that um, Lion Aid have put in the, the white, what we call the white rhino there. It isn't white, of course, um, because it's the other one, the black rhino, which is much more endangered than the white rhino. But nonetheless, both of them are still on the, uh, the vulnerable, very vulnerable list. And of course, if you think about the numbers and again, the size of the continent, uh, lions down at likely fewer than 10,000 uh, really are in a rather worse situation. So how has all this come about? What are the major threats to, uh, to lion survival? Well, disease, human wildlife conflict, trophy hunting, and habitat loss. Those are the four key areas which are responsible for us uh, or what Africa's lions arriving at the situation they're in now. If we look at disease, first of all, lions suffer from many diseases of different kinds, as it mentions there, parasitic disease, bacterial disease, um, things like mange, possible rabies, which may well come to lions via African dogs, cape hunting dogs, wild dogs, which may have been in contact with village or community dogs in Africa. That is ordinary, not wildlife dogs, but what one might call from UK feral dogs, uh, but which uh, live with people in communities and, and uh, villages. Um, or of course, lions, if they get to villages and in those areas, again, still may uh, contract rabies, for example. And it mentions there even COVID immune deficiency virus, which erodes the immune systems and make them more susceptible to a further rate of um, And there are can others like canine distemper. It mentions other canines there. Um, slight error, I think, maybe a typo, because of course the lions are not uh, canines, they're felids, cats. And of course, possibility of lions catching bovine tuberculosis from cattle, uh, which are quite wide ranging, particularly in East Africa, because a number of the, uh, the indigenous tribes have huge numbers of cattle, uh, which can and often do uh, stray 
into um, into wildlife areas. There is another one as well, uh, which was found in the place called Ngorongoro Crater in northern Tanzania, and that is a disease from biting flies, which are blood suckers similar to um, um, the, uh, and it's gone straight up ahead, malaria and anyway, mosquitoes. Um, and uh, they are, can be so bad uh, that uh, blood is taken from the lions, they become so unwell, they cannot hunt, cannot feed, do not want to feed, and quite a number, particularly in Goro, uh, have died from that. The second threat is human-wildlife conf conflict. There is huge um, acquisition uh, and keeping uh, and using of livestock. This is uh, not wild livestock, of course, what we might consider to be domestic cattle by tribes such as Maasai, typically in East Africa, Kenya, Tanzania, um, and these large herds of cattle are often taken into what is basically really wildlife land uh, for grazing purposes, for water sources. Um, and uh, there's a conflict there because if lions find themselves in a particular situation, perhaps they may be injured, they may be not in a pride at the time, um, or other reasons, lack of prey, let's say, they may resort, unfortunately, to killing livestock. And that's where the uh, problem, this kind of problem often arises. As a result of that, the, the owners of the livestock, the tribes people, will often want to take revenge, as it were, on the predator that, um, that killed their stock. And there's a, a problem there too, because um, authorities in some countries have said, right, we'll, um, we'll give you money, we'll compensate you financially um, if your um, livestock are killed by lions. Then, of course, there's the possibility, which you may or may not realize, of livestock being killed by, let's say, hyenas, who are smaller but pretty strong and very virulent uh, predators in some instances. Um, livestock could be killed by hyenas, but the uh, the owners of the livestock may say to the authorities, oh, no, it was a lion, it was a lion. Uh, the authorities won't know, and of course they'll get the money, uh, and it's not a lion at all. A lion might be shot or killed, poisoned, and um, it, when it was really actually a, a hyena. The other aspect under that heading there is this subject of the, uh, the bushmeat trade. With Africa's increasing, largely increasing populations, uh, it has become more popular uh, for ordinary people to more or less demand protein. They want meat, as opposed to the more vegetarian diet that they traditionally uh, subsisted on in previous years. And so people more usually to start with individuals started going into game areas, started poaching, shooting, trapping, antelope for a start, really. Um, smaller antelope, but that has got bigger and bigger as people have become accustomed to having meat, more people want it, and the bushmeat trade has now taken on, we understand, uh, rather more significant commercial aspects uh, and status, um, and that has become that much more of a problem and um, has started to erode uh, predator-prey populations. It mentions their third bullet point, mitigation measures can be put in place. And I'll be talking about that a little bit later because it's one of the key initiatives which LionAid are actually active in putting together in Southern Kenya. And I'll be able to give you a little bit more detail on that and how they are hoping with one particular community to reduce this human wildlife conflict and by doing that um, safeguard the lives of lions.
that's uh, that's just a photographic illustration there, by the way, um, of uh, a boma. A boma is a fence around a livestock and or um, human habitation area. On the uh, right hand image, the photograph there is one for purely for a tribal livestock, quite possibly Maasai in Kenya or Tanzania there. And yet on in the, uh, the left hand photograph, you can see uh, what's more like a traditional, what they call Maasai Manyata, where the, uh, the tribe members or community members have their own huts. But within that, you can see smaller bomas as well uh, to try and protect the livestock. These bomas are traditionally uh, made from interwoven, numerous interwoven um, branches and boughs of acacia trees, which uh, have, as you may realize, uh, numerous thorns, and so really form a fairly uh, impenetrable ba barrier to predators, typically lions or maybe hyenas and leopards. Um, and so that's the kind of protection that the tribes have been using until now. But although it certainly sounds as though it's likely uh, cool proof or lion proof, then um, it uh, yeah, isn't always the case. But it is an area where things that I just mentioned on the previous slide, things can and through lion aid hopefully will improve. Next threat is trophy hunting. As it mentions there, tens of thousands of lions have been taken out of Africa uh, by this. It is a fairly cruel sport in a number of ways. Um, trophy hunting in more recent times is very, very different from the trophy hunting of 100 plus years ago, where a hunter or someone who is rich can be taken out into the bush by an experienced white hunter, so to speak, like the, the chap who, with that sort of appearance in the upper photo with the male lion, um, and uh, wander through the bush on their own, looking for a suitable game to shoot with a relatively simple, okay, still lethal, but a relatively unsophisticated firearm, something perhaps akin to, or maybe just a bit more sophisticated than a First World War Lee Enfield 303. Um, but nonetheless, people in those days, 1900, 1920s, uh, were at rather more risk uh, hunting lions than they are now, where they now go around in modern four-wheel drives with really high-powered modern high-tech rifles and can shoot trophies, including lions, obviously, from, uh, from the safety of a modern four-wheel drive vehicle. Um, there are instances where this has happened and have been publicized. You may be aware of the, uh, the wildlife biologist, photographer, author, Jonathan Scott, who did Big Cat Diary on TV years ago in his very first book he wrote called The Marsh Pride, about the pride of lions in the Maasai Mara game reserve in Southern Kenya. The very, in the very first chapter, he described how a fine male lion was shot by a, a rich person on a trophy hunting safari, and they were shot from uh, a Land Rover. There's another instance which became really quite infamous, actually, in um, 2005, I think it was, where a very well-known lion, by then who had gone, been dubbed Cecil for some reason, um, fine specimen, well-known to guides, really appreciated and almost loved, if you like, by many tourists who wanted to get close to the lions, get really good photo, uh, photos of them. Um, and this particular lion, as I say, very popular, superb um, specimen of his species, and was shot by a particularly rich American dentist, shot with a high-tech, high-powered bow. It took the dentist and some hours between the two occasions, two shots to kill him. And uh, when that became public, there was really quite a 
cry of outrage as to what had been done, how it had been done, because if I remember rightly, um, it was perhaps just outside the reserve, plus the fact that uh, the agency who were accompanying the dentist did not have a permit to uh, shoot lion as a sporting trophy. So there are a number of issues there. There is in fact a book who was written by a chap called Andrew Loveridge on the whole affair. It's called The Lion Hearted and it's the history of Cecil and his brothers, two of whom, because there are three in his original native pride, um, two of his brothers had earlier, unfortunately, gone off wandering outside the reserve and again, they have been shot. So the whole, all three from the, the coalition of three were eventually together when they became adults. Uh, the other two brothers were shot earlier. And finally, the third and final one, Cecil, uh, who'd survived for so long, uh, was shot with a bow this time, not with a firearm. Uh, and uh, so they just disappeared from the lion population altogether. But uh, Lionheart is a, is a really nice book. Um, as I say, Andrew Loveridge, if you are interested in taking the details or I can let you have them at some stage later. Um, it's not just about the, the shooting of um, a Cecil. Uh, there is a fair amount of information um, and other stories around that, but it does give you the detail and um, illustrate how things like bending the rules and I'm not going to mince words, corruption can come into this sort of thing um, where particularly, I mean, if you go as far as China, you're probably aware of tiger bones uh, being in great demand in, in China for many years now. Hence, we've got relatively few tigers in the word world. We've got a relatively similar situation now with lion bones. So trophy hunting, not to be encouraged at all, despite the fact that many uh, protagonists of the activity will say, oh, it aids conservation because it brings money in. No, 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 it may bring money in, but only to certain people and it very rarely helps the conservation movement. That slide, if you can see it, folks, says um, space and wild areas to live in. Lions, like most large mammals in Africa and in other parts of the world, need, need large amounts of space to live in. Elephants do as well. They're a, a much more recognized species among the, the endangered species. Um, and elephants wander huge different distances uh, in their daily lives. They're not territorial, um, but um, it's not possible for, and I'm just giving this as an example in other species, um, there are migration routes in the African country I know best, if I can use that word, um, throughout Kenya, where elephants in their hundreds used to be able to migrate at different seasons, times of the year, depending on the weather, the food, the water sources, um, through Africa, from the east, just an inland from the east coast, up to the north, up into the northern frontier district, which is more arid, and then coming back down through central Kenya, back down to the southern plains, and often perhaps into across the border into Tanzania. Elephants cannot take those migration routes now. The thing is that habitat loss has been brought about by the exponential increase in human population in Africa. A well-known um, owner, operator of a well-known uh, wildlife conservatory, conservancy in central Kenya um, recently gave some information in relation to, relation to this problem um, they know the information is right. They're there on the spot, been in the country for years, been working with this problem. Uh, and the information they gave was that in recent times, the population, human population of Kenya has gone from 9 million up to 30 million. And when this statement was made, well, it was a few years ago. I have seen in looking at other related information on Google Maps and Google Earth. I've seen a town in central Kenya called Nanyuki, 
we had friends in Kenya there, expat people who'd been there for many, many, many years. Um, and we used to visit them in Nanyuki last time we were there, just in 2002. I look at the town of Nanyuki now on Google Maps, and it is significantly larger than it was when we were there almost 19 years ago. So that is a major part of the, a major factor in the habitat loss problem. Yes, for lions, but for all African wildlife, but most particularly for lions, because you're possibly aware, I don't know, but lions live in prides, of course, and as a result of that, they are territorial. Prides have and hold a particular territory of a minimum size. And they do that because in that area, there are sources of water, regular water. Also, there are adequate, if not abundant, sources of prey animals. And so they are dependent, lions are dependent on having that space to live in. And in any wildlife area, national park or game reserve of any reasonable size, you will normally or would have normally found that there were, there were at least several lion prides. That situation is uh, not uh, quite the same now. In conjunction with the expansion of Africa's population is their activities. Even at village level, individual level, people want their own little shamba, a little bit of piece of land where they can try and grow and cultivate vegetables, maize, corn, meal, posho, various, uh, usually uh, vegetation, um, vegetarian type uh, plants, which they can uh, supplement or base their regular diet on. That's just a small end. That's the, the thin end of the wedge, so to speak, where you get larger communities, they want and need more land. And that is just thinking about things from the individual and community perspective. If you look at the broader commercial or pseudo commercial perspective, then things start to escalate. You get commercial interests in, again, near Nanyuki, uh, where these friends of ours used to live, which is not far from Mount Kenya. There is now, in fact, that when we were there last time in 2002, there had been quite a bit of development around the Mount Kenya area. Uh, there is a small reserve around the mountain, um, around the Mount Kenya area to grow vegetables, which come to, among others, British supermarkets. You go into Tesco, you look for green beans, and some of them at least will come from Kenya. And they'll come from somewhere, more than likely, around Mount Kenya. There are other uh, commercial crops, if you like, numerous other food crops, vegetables typically, but also fruits, um, which need the same sort of cultivation areas. Another example is flowers. There's a lady, or was a lady, by the name of Joan Root. She was the ex-wife of a man called Alan Root, who's one of the best British wildlife filmmakers we have had. She lived, after separating from Alan, she lived on the shores of Lake Naivasha in southern Kenya. In the time she lived there, she became very much aware of encroaching development on the shores of the lake for the growing of flowers. And this business was mushering this commercial activity. She made various representations. She tried to do certain, uh, take certain actions in conjunction with local authorities, local communities to stem this growth. Because apart from anything else, it was killing the wildlife and it was polluting the lake. This saga went on for some time until unfortunately, Joan Root was murdered in her own house, more than likely by people connected with the uh, commercial flower growing concerns. She was too much of an inconvenience for these people. And it can. So these things can now 
get to that sort of level. So habitat loss, as I say, is a really a very fundamental factor uh, in the, the loss of, yes, wider um, wildlife populations, but more particularly because they are territorial um, in the uh, reduction, drastic reduction in lion populations. The, uh, just to mention um, one other thing in relation to that, I did mention earlier Ngoro Ngoro Crater, which is a wildlife area in northern Tanzania. Um, there's a problem there, and this is quite a specific one. Nonetheless, it has, or certainly has potential for a similar effect. And that is that um, the, I don't know if you've ever heard of it, but it is a, it's what's correctly called in, in geology, a caldera. It's a collapsed volcano, um, but it's uh, an area, a circular, which has a circular 2000 foot high ridge all the way around this huge wildlife area. You can go down, uh, go down and many people do, tourists go down, drive down, a bit of a hazardous journey certainly, having done it a couple of times, um, down rocky roads at two, to 2,000 feet and to the greater floor. Um, and it's, it's a great place to see wildlife, really quite a lot of uh, variety in there. But the problem is, again for other species, but most particularly again for lions, is that you start to get inbreeding because the wildlife populations and individual members by and large cannot or will not ascend the crater walls to get out of the crater and go and breed with other uh, species groups. Likewise, to come down, get up the other side from the outside and then come down into the crater to start to um, broaden the genetic, genetic diversity within the crater. And there has been evidence in recent times of, uh, as you can probably imagine, uh, of quite a bit of inbreeding of the lion population in the crater uh, with sort of effects that one can perhaps only imagine. Um, aborted births of cubs, uh, malformations, increased level of disease, and those sort of things. Now, there should be, folks, a brief video, um, which uh, I can show you just to, to line A to, oh yes, before we get to that, uh, the human wildlife conflict uh, issue. Lion Aid has made an agreement with a particular Maasai community in the Amboseli area of Southern Kenya to trial this, this project, which they hope will help to very much reduce human wildlife conflict in that very particular area. The intention is that yes, Maasai will retain the bombers, but they will uh, fit them with small solar panels to generate electricity for the benefit of the, the community. They will also fit bomber um, edges, the uh, fences and uh, acacia um, hedges with flashing, small flashing lights, which is the kind of thing which will likely deter lions from actually approaching the bombers. In addition to that, what Lion Aid are going to do is to help the Maasai to, over time, get together what they're calling an insurance herd. So in other words, breeding of cattle will be extended and some of that will be separated. Some of the, uh, the new cattle, the calves, etc., will be separated from the main herd and they will be, by means of, of financial um, incentives, um, and they will be kept separate. They'll be classed as the insurance herd, so that if a lion or predator, but more particularly a lion, gets into the, the bomber and or kills um, a goat or a cow, then the Maasai will be compensated by receiving an animal 
from the insurance herd. So they will be no worse off in that sense than they have been before. And that will hopefully diffuse and take away uh, that desire for the tribe's people to, um, to go and out and kill a lion, in our case, um, as retaliation for that animal having been taken from their main livestock herd. So that's the project which Lion Aid are working on at the moment. Uh, it's in the state, uh, development stages, but uh, there's certainly a firm agreement being made in relation to them doing that, committing resources to that. And it is possible, maybe even in time, that uh, members of the charity or possible vo possibly volunteers um, will be able to actually go out there um, and see the, uh, the project, maybe help with the project for a while. Um, and hopefully if it succeeds, or it seems to succeed, then that can be repli replicated in other areas with other Maasai communities, with other tribal communities. In addition to uh, that initiative in Africa, the charity are uh, involved in various other activities, uh, communicating with key groups, lobbying, of course, as many people do for uh, uh, worthy causes, liaising most importantly with the people in Africa, the communities, but also community leaders, getting them uh, on side, as it were, in relation to the, the overall initiative. Uh, and of course, with African government officials, local officials, game officials, people in local and central African governments. They've embarked as well on an education program for young people. One of the key resources which uh, I have, and I'm trying to do something with locally, um, is uh, a learning pack, Lion Aid learning pack uh, for key stage two children, the older age children in primary schools. I've already spoken to Mrs. Davies at Brinderi about them um, having access to obtaining a copy of the learning pack, uh, myself going along at some appropriate time to go and do a presentation uh, to the children in relation to lions and um, what uh, what they mean uh, as a as an asset uh, to our world, to our society internationally, not just as, uh, nationally in Africa as well. So uh, we will be and other volunteers will be going to other schools in, rela in relation to this education program and looking at other similar initiatives as well. Uh, talking to groups of adults, yes, as I am this evening with yourselves, um, as well as doing the, uh, the work in, and spreading the word as it were in communities in, in Africa. And so 
there are a number of ways in which people can help if they are sufficiently interested. Um, Lion Aid, as I say, is a relatively new charity, national charity, just been set up in the last six, six weeks or so, uh, or shall I say, officially launched, although work has been going on for some months prior to that in relation to uh, building up to the, uh, the launch which occurred at the end of uh, the end of May. Um, so there are various ways in which people can help and they do, as you can see at the bottom uh, right hand corner of the slide there, have uh, their own website, of course, lionaid.org. And you can get further information from the website there. People can become a member of the charity. There are three grades of membership. People who might wish to, to make a donation can do so via the website, or there is a QR code which can be used to do that. Even just sign up to the Line Aid newsletter and uh, see how progress, hopefully, is being made in relation to the, uh, the Line Aid initiative. Um, and signing of petitions. Uh, there's a, an organization you may be aware of, which pops up on emails and other places, uh, change.org, and they ho often have hosted uh, Lion Aid uh, and their um, lobbying to uh, get people to sign petition to get our government to prevent the import of sport hunting trophies into the United Kingdom most particularly lions of course and people if they have the time and the inclination and the interest they can uh, they can become a volunteer and they could contact our young lady coordinator a young lady called bridget at lionaid.org to do that or you could take a punt on the lion aid lottery which recently started and there's a fairly substantial prize if you win that. Again, the, uh, there's information on that on the, um, on the Lion Aid website. So, just in um, starting to, to wind up the, the sort of formal part of the presentation, ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you for listening. I hope you found it interesting maybe hopefully you'll have found it challenging um hopefully uh it will have struck a chord in some way with you so that you can consider this as an area uh to perhaps think about uh helping with i will i think just end the presentation apart from any questions any people anyone might want to ask afterwards but just with a very very brief anecdote 1999 tarangiri national park uh, in september october small camp small research team including five temporary volunteers for a month including yours truly and um eight or nine o'clock at night by which time it's been dark for two hours, campfires burning. We're just, we've had our evening meal and we're um, just sort of wandering around the camp before deciding whether we're going to turn in ready for an early start next morning. And all of a sudden, I mean, we have had lions wandering around the camp quite closely, lionesses on the, the borders of the camp. And we've had to try and shoo them away with the Land Rover. Anyway, this night, this evening, um, all of a sudden, we hear a lion roar. I've heard lions roar in Chester Zoo and been quite impressed because I've been at close quarters to them. I have never heard anything like I heard that night in Tarangiri. The volume was, to say the very least, significantly greater. I was starting to feel a bit scared, I will be honest. It was obviously pointing at our direction and coming in our direction. I have never heard a sound like it. It really, literally was awesome. Fortunately for us, perhaps, 
because we uh, the supervisor said right i think we need to get in the land rover so we all crammed into a into a land rover in the event because he was pretty sure it was one of the males they'd identified that they called john for some reason um and he says john it's john coming this way so we all six of us seven of us crammed into this land rover uh like proverbial telephone box and uh, anyway the the roars did subside for better or for worse john if it was him didn't come into our camp and uh, the so uh, sound died down for better or for worse and uh, the animal obviously went away or took another tack and decided uh, he wasn't going to roar anymore and, and certainly not in our direction but really that is the last thing i'd like to say i appreciate it. i'm from i'm sure be the only person who's heard that sort of thing in a natural real life setting but if you heard it i'm sure you would be really well absolutely dare i say it, blown away i cannot think of africa without that sound thank you oh, thank you very much ian that was a, a very interesting and very informative talk um i wonder if anybody has any questions all right if if i if i could just ask you one you mentioned mitigation and you spoke you've spoken about maasai in east africa what about the situation in places like south africa where there are obviously still quite large large-ish numbers of lions are there any projects going on there there may well be um individual projects uh, which are active as i say lion aid are um focusing particularly on the species okay in in their activities and their initiatives there are other organizations well-known organizations global organizations like wwf uh, you've also in britain you've got the born free foundation who initially uh, launched as it were really on the back of elsa the lioness who was brought up by um, joy and george adamson and returned to the wild um, and they've been working again with wildlife generally for many years but with some degree of focus on lions um, I can't say whether they're doing anything in, in South Africa, but I'm sure there will be. Um, and I think you'll likely find that um, in that sense, in relation to local or more localized situations, uh, it will quite possibly be the, uh, the game area um, owners, operators, who will be taking local action wherever they can uh, quite possibly, okay, with funding from uh, larger organizations, international organizations, perhaps like WWF. Um, but I'm, I'm not aware of anything in South Africa. Um, South Africa is, is rather different from typically um, Botswana, let's say, or East Africa, Kenya, Tanzania, uh, in the sense that there's a greater proliferation in South Africa more in the uh, the northern part of the country of private game reserves so you've got uh, places like sabi sands sabi sabi uh, and another one whose name escapes me at the minute fairly close to um kruger national park i mean if you think about kruger national park i have no idea what the lion population is there it's right up in the northeast corner of south africa and really in the context of the country of south africa itself is really quite a small area but if i tell you that kruger national park is the size of wales okay with all the game that's in there um but as i say to the east of kruger along the um and just in inland or south if you like from the the northern south africa border with no zambique and zimbabwe there are quite a few uh, fairly well known privately owned and run and reserves um so it's quite possible as i say that um 
local people, local operators are taking their own initiatives in the local areas, depending on circumstances, because each area will be different in relation to human population density, human activity and the nature of that, um, and the attitude of, of local people, the extent to which uh, game conservancy operators have, as it were, built bridges, communications, relationships with local people uh, to try and uh, reduce the possibility of, of any conflict. Thank you. I don't know if that answers your question, David. It's yes, I think it does. Thank you. Has anyone else got a, a question? Is David the purpose got... to actually increase the population of the lions? And if so, isn't that in, in turn going to bring conflict with human nature who will be in fear of too many lions and they'll start hunting them again? <laughs> right. Well, first of all, David, certainly based on the, the figures that I've mentioned, I think it's highly unlikely that uh, anyone really is going to, apart from perhaps the, the community people with livestock, uh, are going to start to uh, come round to the idea that, oh, hang on, hang on, we've got too many lions in Africa. Um, I think it's highly unlikely. What we're actually trying to do globally, yes, Lion Aid and its own initiative, but also other organisations in slightly perhaps peripheral ways, through WWF, for example, Born Free Foundation and others, uh, and the conservancies trying to build up their own populations. Um, we're trying to get back to where lion populations were 20 years ago. Nice. Um, and, uh, but the, the thing is, it's, it's not so much, I mean, the fear of lions has very much gone away because, um, I mean, the very first time I went to Kenya in 1990, uh, I, um, I spent the last three days in the Maasai Mara, and most of the time I was out there Didn't on the reserve. I was in, oh yes, I saw them. Yeah, oh, right. um, from the safety of a Land Rover. I knew perfectly okay. Uh, at one point, myself and a young American woman who was in, in the same Land Rover as, as me, um, we were right next to a small group from a pride, two lionesses and two or three cocks, and they were asleep, and we were no more. In fact, less than six feet away. And this young American woman say, What would happen if I got out of here now? And uh, our Kenya native guide said, Instant breakfast. So, yeah, I, I think it's a bit unlikely. Um, we'll be lucky if we get to back to, you know, in foreseeable future, if we get back to where land population was 20, 30 years ago. There's, I mean, the other thing is, I mean, just to highlight the situation too, I mean, there's one um, really good example that, that I sort of didn't mention. Um, yes, East Africa, Kenya, Tanzania, Southern Africa, Botswana. Um, and this isn't just another illustration, folks, I'm afraid, of how things can deteriorate. Um, I mentioned deserts, no lions in deserts. That's not quite true because in North Africa, until the 1950s, there were what were called Barbary lions. But the last one was shot about 1950 or 60. More recently, there have been, in quite recent times, um, desert adapted lions in the deserts of Namibia. I have a fabulous book on my bookshelf about them. And there are serious question marks as to whether or not they still exist. As a film, which has been on TV twice anyway, in the last year or three, um, about those, and uh, filmed by the researcher who wrote the book that I have. And um, there was a group of five, five males who were going around and they were trying um, desperately, wandering in different directions to find females to match up with. And uh, TV program was made, documentary was made, people saw it, no doubt, and thought, oh, wow, wouldn't it be great? Because at the end of the program, they said, after making this film, we found that only a short distance away, oh, in whatever direction, there was a group of lionesses. Oh, wonderful. Short time after that, again, the five were killed. Some of them were shot, and the rest were poisoned. So we, I don't know, just do not know 
if there remain any desert adapted lions in Namibia now. Quite possibly there may not be. The odd one or two, three, however many, I don't know. But that's just another example, fortunately, of the sort of thing that's, that's been happening. Uh, and it's, it's a great shame. Okay, well, there don't seem to be any more hands up. So um, if I can thank Ian on behalf of everybody for such an excellent talk. Um, as usual, there will be a, a little gift which will be arriving at your door. There uh, will be a knock and somebody will move away. So I hope you enjoy it and uh, look forward to seeing you again soon. Right, we will now right, carry well, thank, thank you very much again, David and, and everyone. Uh, if you'll excuse me, unfortunately, I've got a couple of things that I need to do. So I will let you continue with your deliberations. And as I say, th thank you very much again for allowing me to do the presentation. And please do look at the web line aid website. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Right, if we carry on, we'll move on to the minutes of the last meeting, which was uh, on the 1st of March. We had a talk by Simon Bradwick and Paul Barrett about the, the living TAF. And then we had uh, some other items on there. Uh, we mentioned the hustings, which obviously have, have taken place. Um, we mentioned uh, that the association had set up a new page on the community website, uh, concentrating on planning matters and uh, gave the address of that. Um, the LDP was discussed and that's going to come up again a little bit later. Hopefully we'll get something on the, the bridge over the railway line as well. Uh, we also wrote in with our objections that people had asked us to do to the uh, building of the houses in Danes Court between Debray's Close and Radder Court Road, uh, and also wrote to uh, Redrow about hedgerows along the High Crescent Road, though needless to say there was no other answer from them at all. Um, I think that was all, unless anybody has got any other items from uh, the minutes. No? Okay. Treasury's report. David. Right. Well, we started the year with um, a bank balance of 8,172. We owed Pews £190, and that reduced it to 7,983. There's been little activity, as you're probably well aware, through the year. However, we've at the present time, we, we've generated a deficit of 67 pounds however we've had income we've had grants of 880 pound and we've had expenditure of 963 pounds which includes insurance um, web costs and the lottery license there's also been a donation to charity of 2278 pound from the schools and the wi which we passed on to 10 of us so we are ready for the September festival with a bank balance of £7,916. Okay, thank you, David. Um, the next item is the, the September festival. Uh, at the moment, we're still going ahead planning for the events that we can. Uh, everything we're trying to do is very much in the, the hands of the Welsh Government. Um, obviously, it's very difficult when we don't know what's going to be allowed. Uh, we were obviously looking forward to the, the announcements earlier in June when we thought we'd be fully in stage one, and then we'd find out what was happening in July, hopefully being more in line uh, with England and Scotland. However, nothing has happened in Wales, and we really don't know what is going to happen now. Um, we are waiting for the next announcement in July and that hopefully even if it does what was originally supposed to happen in june we're hoping there will be some announcement about what's going to happen next because that's really what we we need to know at the moment um most of our events wouldn't be viable with the numbers of people who can currently attend and we're, we're waiting for that but we are carrying on with our planning and there will be some events which would go ahead anyway um and we have to make our final decisions by the 1st of August, we've decided. So we're hoping things will go ahead, but we really are waiting now for, for the politicians to decide. 
Um, we had transport from Wales. I know the, uh, the, the was supposed to be um, an item on the bridge by Glynis Farm, which was uh, supposed to go to the council, but didn't. Uh, Alan was going to give us some information on this. Um, I don't know, Hugh, it, do you have any further information on what's going on with transport for Wales and the bridge and things? Uh, um, me? Yes, I'm the only Hugh here, is it? Yeah, yeah. All, all I know is that it's going to uh, planning committee in, in, in July. Um, we've objected to it. I think you have as well. Yeah. We've, we've proposed an alternative. Um, and we've also asked if, if we can um, 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 attend planning committee and say a few words on behalf of, of, of residents in, in Morganstown and Radha. So we wait, we wait for the planning committee in July. Okay, thank, thank you very much for the information. I mean, the, if, 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 I mean, the other things I know about Transport for Wales is that they are continuing to discuss with Cardiff Council, Rada Rangers and ourselves, uh, A, the need to provide facilities for the Rada Rangers when they build their Hall Road to the Morganstown compound, which will go through the cabins that the Rada Rangers use now. So they'll, in, they'll build a temporary cabin uh, whilst they put in a planning application for a, a permanent clubhouse for the Radar Rangers and we are pressing for that to um, include facilities for, for the wider community so that people may for instance have kids par kids parties there combine it with, with a football match etc etc so um, but that will certainly be an improvement on, on the couple of buildings that the Rangers have got there now. And the only other thing I'll say is Transport for Wales are keen to uh, um, provide community benefit um, and uh, are interested in things like uh, biodiversity. So if the RMA have got any ideas there. And, and excitingly, they also have a mock-up of the new train carriages they're going to be using. Um, and residents are invited to go to Tafswell to, to, um, to play on those. <laughs> Okay. Okay. Thank you, Dave. Thank, thank you very much, Hugh. Okay, planning. Um, Ian. Yes. So I, I think the the news is there is not much news. As Hugh just said, the the bridge planning application hasn't yet been heard by the council. Um, other planning applications we've been keeping an eye on have either uh have basically not appeared yet, but, but we're waiting for the for them to do so. As we've heard that they're they're in the offing. Uh, and we'll report when when we do uh, hear about them formally. Uh, and I think the the other matter on planning is the local development plan, which we we geared you all up for the last time that we we properly met as an association. Uh, we've been I've been uh, to the official launch for Cardiff review of the LDP. Um, their consultation website has has appeared, but again it is somewhat lacking in detail that we can actually get our teeth into. So I think it's another. Um, We'll let you know when we've got something to let you know about uh, that, that we can actually uh, get our teeth into in terms of the review of the local development plan for, for Cardiff from uh, for the future. Can I, can I yeah. uh, say something about the LDP? Yeah. Oh, thank you. Yeah, uh, same as Ian, we, 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 we went to the... Um, the launch and we're studying the documents um, and a lot of it is about um, the future of Cardiff as a capital city and what the centre is going to look like and, and I was wondering um, do you think that we as residents of Radra and Morganstown should comment on how the LDP will affect us in our communities but should we also have an interest in what it will do for our capital city and, and, and comment on plans for the centre and developing tourism and that sort of stuff. Should we, should we remain parochial or take a, a, a wider interest in the city? Any views on that? Well, I, 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 I certainly feel that as, as citizens of Cardiff um, and somebody who's particularly interested in schools and other things, yes, the that the whole city is important to us. We may be more, in, more interested in our own local area, which is what, what I'd expect, but certainly we should take an interest in, in Cardiff as a whole. 
Mm. Uh, it's something that happens in other bits of Cardiff that, that do affect that. Yeah, that's what I think too. The, the other view to take on that, that's you and David, is um, the way that we are connected to the rest of our city and to look at it from our access to facilities, services, opportunities even. Um, you know, it, it's all well and good having a, a new uh, arena, for example, I know, I know is, is part of the, the things being talked about amongst this being a capital, but it's only any good if, if we, the residents of, of Radra and Morgantown, can get to and from it. Uh, efficient, uh, effectively, efficiently, uh, with with suitable public transport and so forth. Uh, otherwise, it's a, it's not really of much use to us. And I think there are certainly angles of that for us to explore as the the local development plan process uh, unfolds over the next few years. Uh, that's a good point, Ian. Thank you. Any other comments? Anything else, Ian? Uh, no, I think that, that was it for my for my planning bits and pieces. Thank you. Okay. Has anybody got anything else they wish to mention? Okay, in that case, uh, I'd like to thank you all for coming along today. Our next meeting is on the 16th of August, and we have a speaker, Ruth Marks. Ruth is the Chief Executive for the Wales Council for Voluntary Action. And uh, I think that's something that obviously we've always spoken about, uh, doing things, volunteering in the community and other stuff. And, and she is, is, as I said, the Chief Executive of the Wales Council. So hopefully that should be another interesting talk. So thank you all very much for coming along. Just today. to say she lives locally, lives in yep. the drive. Yep. So we have another local expert. Thank you. Okay. Thank you all very much.